Welcome to another episode of From the Archives. So, as per usual, this is the news and updates section of the podcast uh, that's exclusive for people who are watching the live stream and also exclusive for, I guess you could say, well, maybe not exclusive, but um, intended for people who are watching on YouTube. Sorry, I am just making sure I have my reviews pulled up and ready for when I need to, to talk about them. <clears throat> and of course, have my script at the handy. So the updates, at least for this podcast, are I decided to switch over to Anchor, anchor.fm, um, just because I don't know why I thought SoundCloud exclusively would be the best option. Um, ooh, sorry for all the, the loud clicks and noises and whatnot. Um, but I guess having uploaded, what, five episodes now to SoundCloud, I felt like there's probably a better way to distribute the podcast. So I decided to go with um, Sound or not SoundCloud, Anchor. And at least so far in the last 24 hours, things have been pretty good. I see how you can easily monetize the podcast. Not that that's really the intention. Ultimately, the goal is to sort of force me into actually cleaning out my bookshelf because I don't want to be one of those professors that like 20 years from now has all these books on their bookshelf and they're like, oh yeah, I read them once um, and sort of circulate the books, you know? Uh, but it would be nice to make a couple bucks if I could while doing this podcast. So yeah, I started using Anchor and they already have ads that I did a script for this morning, recorded. Um, we already have five episodes. We, I say that as if I'm the royal we. There's already five episodes on Spotify. I didn't check Google, but apparently there's like four or five different um, apps that you can get your podcasts on that it's already a feature um, on. So you can now find from the archives on a whole bunch of podcast apps, which is pretty exciting. However, something I didn't think about when I started this podcast was um, using the word archive. There are so many podcasts that have archive in them. So when you go to do a Google search of from the archives, you get a bunch of hits and a bunch of results. Um, so that might, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but certainly, you know, we'll see. We'll see how things go. I'm not looking to be the next Joe Rogan or, or uh, uh, I don't know what other what other huge podcasts are out there. I don't listen to Joe Rogan, but I know he's a very pretty popular podcaster. Um, other news and events. I will be probably once a month. We'll see how it goes, but on the regular, I want to do episodes that are specific to sets of books, so that way I don't end up having like a different episode for different editions of the book, because I do have, you know, professor copies, um, or I guess educator copies of a lot of textbooks, and it just seems silly to do separate sort of reviews of textbooks when I could just do like, for example, intro to archeology span textbooks. I've got like a gazillion of those. I'd probably could just do one really long episode. And that's probably what I'll do is a really long episode of just intro to archeology span textbooks. So like I have, um, why am I looking over here? Like just look, just looking on my shelf, I can pull out one, two, uh, there's like two more down there. Principles in archeology, span uh, world prehistory and archeology. Span We've got Archaeology Essentials. Um, and then, of course, I've got like four editions of Archaeology, Archaeology Essentials. So I think maybe condensing those into um, one mega episode, talking about all of the different intro to archaeology textbooks and giving my feedback, sort of sort of like a professor's review of like, hey, if you have to take this uh, textbook, because some of these textbooks are still being used. Like I know Archaeology Essentials by Renfrew and Bond is used still. And I know... Um, you know, world prehistory and archaeology, that textbook is still used by some people. So I figured it'd probably be best if I just did a whole conglomerate review episode on intro to archaeology textbooks. And the same is true of cultural anthropology textbooks, because I've got a gajillion of those and um, human evolution textbooks, sort of just doing a mega episode on them, uh, just so then people can get a quick broad brushstroke. Those will probably be super useful to other like professors, I would guess, but I guess students would hopefully have interest in knowing um, how a, at least one professor feels about all these different intro to archaeology textbooks. 
because there are a ton of them and they are not all created equal. Um, there's a few of them that I'm not a big fan of, but I thought episodes like that would be interesting to do. And I think probably next week's will be an episode on dictionaries because I have probably like six or seven dictionaries from different eras and it'll tie in nicely with the lesson I'm doing in one of my classes. So I figured I might as well do a compilation episode reviewing dictionaries and why it's useful to have um, more than one type of dictionary in your house. Um, not necessarily saying you need a dictionary for um, reference to books, but it'd be useful to have a dictionary um, for other reasons that I'll get into in probably next week's episode when we talk about dictionaries, which I know is not like you're not going to go to Goodreads and read about a dictionary, but there you have it. So I think that's all the news I have for this in, in the recent week. So switching over to Anchor FM, you should be able to find this episode once I edit it and upload it to, um, you can find it on Spotify, um, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, all those different podcast networks that you might use. So that's sort of the exciting news update there. But with that being said, we're going to now get ready for um, actually doing the recorded part of it. So that means I will be looking at a script for the introduction, and there will be a few of it that's scripted, but some of it is not so scripted. So with that being said, let's get rolling into um, this week's episode, episode six of From the Archives. Hello, and welcome to From the Archives, a short podcast where I talk about a book from my library and whether you should or shouldn't read it. I'm Eric, a professor of anthropology at Cuyahoga Community College, and welcome to my library. The books in my library are sometimes old, sometimes rare, sometimes normal, but always interesting. This podcast is recorded live on Twitch at Anthropology Archives every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's Anthropology Archives, all one word, lowercase. During live recordings, I promise to read all questions and comments from the chat in a different voice or accent to make it seem like someone else is asking those questions or leaving those comments. Uh, I do the same with reviews as well. Don't worry, if you've missed the live stream, you can listen to old episodes uh, on SoundCloud. And now, thanks to Anchor FM, you can listen to them on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you can watch old episodes on my YouTube channel of the same name, Anthropology Archives, in case you wanted to see what the books look like and if there's any sort of visual components of it uh, that I talk about in the podcast. You can usually catch those on the YouTube channel. Every episode, I ask myself the following questions. Who wrote the book? What's it about? What are other people saying about it? Should you read it? And whether I should can it or keep it? Uh, so is it going into the um, book recycling bin or is it staying on the bookshelf? With that being said, let's pull a book from the shelf. And we're not going very far. I'm literally just turning around here. And there's the sound of it. I did come up with the clever idea for those watching either live or on the YouTube channel. Um, hopefully this works. I'm, st I'm setting the book on my desk and letting it sit straight up so that it just sits in front of the camera so that when you're watching, you can just see the book for front, front and center. And this week we're talking about Creekside, an archaeological novel by Kelly Carmine. It was published in 2010 by Fire Ant Books, which is a subsidiary of the University of Alabama Press. Um, She's also written, Kelly Carmine has also written uh, two other books, the, or at least archaeology novels, I should say. The other ones being uh, Water Lily. Oh, what's the full title? It's got a subtitle to it, which is such a classic archaeologist thing to do. If it doesn't have a colon in the title, then how do we know it's an archaeological um, you know, report or something written by an archaeologist? Uh, her other book published in 2017 is House of the Water Lily, a novel of the ancient Maya. And then, um, oh, let's navigate back to the other one. Uh, Spider Woman Walks This Land, Traditional Cultural Properties and the, Not and the Navajo Nation, which was written in 2002. So Kelly Carmine got her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in 1990 with a specialization in Mayan archaeology. So I guess it makes sense that she would write a book about, you know, Mayan archaeology in 2017. She's been an associate professor at Eastern Kentucky University since the early 90s. So shortly after she graduated, she, um, you know, landed a gig at Eastern Kentucky and has been teaching there ever since. 
Um, I have a few friends who live in um, Richmond, which is where Eastern Kentucky University is, and that's how I ended up with a copy of Creekside. So this book came to me through, I guess, word of mouth. Um, you know, friends who live in Richmond who are not archaeologists, but they knew I'm an archaeologist, ended up snagging a copy of it, presumably because they live right next to EKU's campus. And then they said, oh, this is a perfect book for Eric, gifted it to me. And it sat on my shelf for several years because I was busy in undergrad and grad school and, you know, life got away from me. So I didn't have a chance to get, get to reading it until um, the summer of 2018 when I was slated to teach a historic archaeology class. So for a little context there, historic archaeology is, and it relates to this book because I used this book in the class, Historic archaeology is a subdiscipline of anthropology and, well, technically a subdiscipline of archaeology where they have a slightly different methodology. Really, you could subdivide archaeology, at least I think methodologically and theory-wise, into three broad brushstroke categories. And those are historic archaeology, prehistoric archaeology, and classical archaeology. Uh, classical archaeology is typically, you'll find that in an art history department. So if you're going into art history, you're kind of learning classical archaeology. Um, and if you're really interested in like stone tools, uh, like the stuff that you can see in the background up here, I've got this lovely stone tool chart in the background that's probably really hard to see. And then some replica stone tools above that. That'd be more prehistoric archaeology. And essentially the division between the two is, is it arch artifacts and features, are they deposited during or contemporaneously with the with written records or are these artifacts predating written records and historic archaeology is contemporaneous with written records which usually means there's slightly different methodologies because they have a lot of detailed records about mass manufacturing uh, this is in the era of like the industrial revolution so you know people are mass producing all sorts of things which has a different rate of deposition for artifacts than say um, stone tools which are individually made no stone tools no two stone tools are the same which is why historic archaeology which is specifically what this book focuses on is a slightly different sort of bent to it theoretically and methodologically i myself am more of a prehistoric archaeologist so i try to have an open and obviously you know prehistoric archaeologist teaching historic archaeology i tried to be as open-minded and as unbiased as possible because I found in the past historic archaeologists and prehistoric archaeologists tend to clash and butt heads because um, the methodology is different. Uh, and I think arguably that stems to stems from prehistoric archaeologists don't have um, you know written records to work with, whereas historic archaeologists do. And so they utilize those historic records slightly differently than, say, a prehistoric archaeologist might. Um, in some cases, treating it sort of like fact, whereas, you know, not everything that's in the archaeological record is fact. But that's a lot of background to get to the point of, I read this in 2018 to prep for a class I was teaching because I was going to use this in the class. And, oh boy, I'm just going to have to be upfront about it. The students were not a fan of me teaching with this book. The idea behind me using this book is, well, I thought it was a novel idea, I know that's a terrible pun, but I thought it was a novel idea to use this book in class because it kind of covered a lot of ground. It covered a, it, topics like metal detection, how to do basic reconnaissance survey in archaeology, um, how to do lab work, some stuff about historical methods. And so I thought it kind of, in, in an interesting way, would be a good a good tool to use. So I basically made it the one of the assigned texts for the class. And then I started reading it after I had decided to make it the assigned text. And so I was like two or three chapters ahead of the students um, during the semester. So like they'd have to read chapter one and I was on like chapter three or four at the time. So I was just barely ahead of them. So I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate what I was making them read. And by the end of it, uh, most of the students were just like, oh, it was such a downer of a book. And I guess this is sort of segueing into my thoughts on it. Um, yeah, this book was very cynical. Um, I felt that it could have been less pessimistic. Pretty much any time it was talking about where the rubber meets the road of like contract archaeology or field work, anything about what it's like to be a real archaeologist, it never painted a happy picture. 
um, constantly talking about the pressure of developers. I mean, sure, that's true of archaeology. You deal with developers who think of archaeologists as thorn in the side. Like, why do we need to care about some stone tools or some broken pottery from a couple hundred years ago? Like, we just want to put a Walmart here. Let's hustle it up. Sure, developers can be like that, but not every developer is um, this sort of progress stops for no one kind of person. And it's also, I think, you know, there's something to be said of maybe don't make it so pessimistic because you can turn a, you can turn off a lot of perspective, I think, students and archaeologists by being so pessimistic. And what I mean by that is it, it felt very much like it was complaining anytime you, you have two characters or two storylines and it bounces between the two. You've got on one end, Meg Harrison, who's a professor. Basically, it's a fictionalized version of, I would assume, Kelly Carmine. Um, <clears throat> and she is she is doing an excavation of a site that's going to be turned into a parking lot or something of that sort. And the other storyline, so it cycles you know, every other chapter of these two storylines. The other storyline is this historical fiction of the site that she's excavating. And what I had a problem with was it sort of created this sort of just so story where it took archaeological data and created this nice beautiful narrative and i had to keep telling my students oh no the stuff that she's talking about is pure conjecture in a typical archaeological setting we could not make the determinations that she is describing in this historical fiction that's a really interesting story a lot of the stuff that she was coming up with but there's no way to corroborate some of the stuff she came up with like you know one of the one of the guys i think it was the father of our main protagonist in the historical um narrative uh, and this takes place in kentucky so it's kind of apropos that i i didn't pick creekside because it kind of segues from our previous uh, episode talking about the shawnees and the war for america but you know overlap in territory so if you read the shawnees and the war for america you'll have a lot of good historical context when reading creekside because it takes place in Kentucky, in the bluegrass region of Kentucky, like northern Kentucky, um, obviously near Richmond, um, Richmond, Kentucky. So uh, circling back, what I was trying to say with that is the the dad of our main protagonist in the historical fiction, he falls off a roof and dies. But at least pathologically and from the material record, there's not really any likelihood that we could determine that he died of a fall from a roof. You probably could, you know, with extensive research, probably figure out that someone died as, the, as a result of a traumatic fall. But to say that they fell off of a roof and that's what caused it would probably be pretty difficult, especially the way she wrote it. And it's things like that that kind of soured me to the book as, as a whole. But there were some things that I, I, I did like. Uh, I did like uh, her description of methodology early on. I felt like it was pretty pretty decent description of how like cultural resource management and contract archaeology works, even if it was a bit cynical. Because certainly you can get burned out pretty quick if you're just a shovel bum. You know, you just have a bachelor's degree. That's certainly the perspective you can have is this very cynical one. Um, but if you get higher up, it's, it's not so grindy. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was pretty funny, and actually what I should do is run over real quick. I should have done this before we started the podcast because I have um, an article of clothing that directly relates to something that the character Meg Harrison has in her book or in the book. So one of the things that was, I think, an accurate trope of the book is the baseball cap. So here is my actual baseball cap that I just grabbed off of the, the shelf. Um, for some reason, I don't know if it's because of Indiana Jones or if this, I think it predated Indiana Jones, to be honest, because I've seen plenty of field photos of archaeologists wearing baseball caps. But really, if you want to look like Indiana Jones, at least in the United States, a lot of archaeologists, although I'd say this is more of a a dying breed kind of thing and you can sort of see all the dirt and grime on this baseball cap from when I would pull it off of my head um, and you know with dirt in my hands but a lot of archaeologists wear a baseball cap oddly enough 
and she, the character Meg Harrison, wears a Dodgers baseball cap. And my biggest qualm <laughs> with with that is actually on page 90 here. It, it's these little details where she gets into, Kelly, Carmine, gets into these really specific details that seem sort of pointless. Like, they're details that don't really drive forward any story. So from a narrative perspective, they're not helpful. And then from an archaeology perspective, an archaeology perspective they're also not helpful because they're details that are not about the historic archaeology like she talks about um a baseball she caught at a twins game uh in the top of the seventh philly's trailing like i get this is historical fiction but uh this book was written two years before interleague play even began i literally wrote in the margins impossible the first interleague game was uh, for the Phillies versus the Twins was in June of 2012, two years before the book was published. So it's stuff like that that, like, you know, now am I assuming that everyone's going to be a big baseball fan and going to catch that real quick? No, but I feel like there was enough detail in this book that it was trying to write a line of, and I have this in my notes, it was trying to write a line of being educational and entertaining, and I feel like it came up short in both. Because it was somewhat educational, but at the price of being overly generalistic and written for, I guess, a general audience that's not in an archaeology class. So if you're a student, it's probably a little too watered down to be super educational. And then as, you know, a novel, you know, uh, Leaves of Grass, this is not. Or, you know, insert whatever great American novel you want it to be. It, it, it was very much lacking in a lot of regards for the narrative aspects of it. And it definitely was, I think, pretty cynical in its overall demeanor. And one of the glaring things that all of my students also just, they just got fed up with it. Like it became, you know, every time we'd come into class, all of the students would just gripe and, and moan and be like, oh my gosh, did you read the latest chapter for this week? Oh, because I'd make them read like a chapter a week for the, the semester because it's, 17 chapters so basically you know a regular 16 week class once a week you read a chapter pretty doable i thought and boy each week it just they got more and more frustrated with the book because the characters in this book are not doing archaeology great by the end of the book um, meg becomes really obsessed with this locket she finds and she just becomes super obsessive with it now have i seen archaeologists get obsessive about an artifact sure but to the level that she got obsessive to the point of like wanting to steal it and wear it around her neck and figure out who EEOM was because it had those were the initials and making all these wild speculations about it about who it was that's that that to me I think was more accurate to why I say cautionarily why I disagree sometimes with historic archaeologists it's not in the methodology it's not in the the content it's that sometimes historic archaeology tends to attract a crowd of people that are looking for nice stories or get really obsessive about a certain particular aspect. To say I'm not obsessive is also sort of the pot calling the kettle black as I have like all these stone tools on the wall. Um, but just the level of obsession felt like, uh, you know, something out of a tragedy or a drama by the end of the, the book because it was just so fixated on this locket. And, and it's like, well, this locket is one aspect of the site it's not going to be this Rosetta Stone. And even the Rosetta Stone is not, you know, this all-seeing silver bullet that, you know, has solved Egyptian um, prehistory. But I guess, yeah, that's, that's that's sort of like my my overall opinion of it. We should probably talk about what other people are saying about the book. So, obviously, I'm not recommending you read this. But let's see at least one other person, Nancy on goodreads gave it a four out of five stars and here's her full review um and nancy mm, i'm not sure what kind of an accent nancy has but we'll give her a southern accent since this is kentucky right so be thematic here i love it when i stumble across some little known book especially when it is totally worth reading meg harrington oh whoops i guess her name wasn't harrison it was harrington my bad meg harrington is a current day archaeologist sent to excavate a field before it is bulldozed for its new subdivision. 
In alternating chapters, Carmine tells the story of Meg and of the three generations who lived on the land in the 1800s. Nicely done. An enjoyable read from the University of Alabama Press and the Cahokia Mounds Museum Society. Side note, I couldn't find anything about Cahokia Mounds Museum Society, so I'm not sure where Nancy's getting that. Um, but anyway, back to her review. Not going to win any literary prizes, but definitely fulfills the author's dual goals of public outreach in archaeology and entertainment. And obviously I have my own opinions about how it doesn't fulfill those roles. And a lot of the other reviews were by people who were not archaeologists saying they really enjoyed it. So I think if it's for a general audience, sure, it, it's, it's okay. Um, do I think it should be taken as gospel or fact or be used in an educating, education setting? No, I learned my lesson the hard way back when I taught that class. And there's at least two students that I found here, one of which I'm almost 100% confident is, yep, that is a student. Uh, that was in my class. So here is a review from a student who had to read this from my class. So this is from Hannah. I read this for class. Oh, sorry, I forgot I have to do it in a southern accent, even though I know Hannah doesn't have a southern accent, but we'll give her one for the sake of, um, you know, the theme and the setting. I read this for class, and it was just truly awful. One star. Uh, now, if we go over to Amazon, again, the ratings are higher. It's got an average 3.7 out of 5. Goodreads, it's 3.65 out of, or sorry, 3.59 out of 5. And it's got about 30% 1 star, 55% 5 star, and 16% 4 star. So it's pretty polarizing, at least on uh, uh, Amazon. And I'm pretty sure I can say the same of rating details. Oh no, most of them are 4 star, only 9%. Uh, actually, 13% are two or one star reviews. So a little bit more balanced on Goodreads. But here's another one from, uh, I believe this is also a student. Yes. So this is by Sergeant Reminder, who I will be reading in a Southern accent once again. Gave it a one out of five stars. Now, they, use, they don't use entirely foul language, but be warned, they do use um, the term abortion. So I'm not, I'm not endorsing that at all. I'm just reading it as it is. This novel is a textual abortion, is the title. The concept of this book is worn out and the writing an affront to our species. I was required to read this book for a class. Upon finishing this last sentence of this, the most painfully contrived and poorly written work I have ever been subjected to, I immediately threw it in the trash, and it was an autographed copy I bought on Amazon for roughly $5. Half of my class had used autographed copies, if that tells you anything. I have never thrown a book away until this one. I felt I was doing humanity a favor. I'd wager that all positive reviews of this literary miscarriage were written by colleagues or students of Dr. Carmine, out of pity. It is a tragedy that is it was ever written. P.S. Read every review of this book and notice the verified purchase ratio. Now, I did look at the verified purchase ratio, ratio and... Yeah, there isn't a whole lot of verified purchase ratios, and some of these are written in August, December, uh, September of 2017 when the book came out. Actually, most of these are, are, are of the five-star and four-star reviews are when the book came out, not verified purchases. And at least one of them, um, I'll have to hunt it down here. It, one of them actually said, oh, I didn't actually buy the book but i know kelly does good work so like openly admitting that they're kind of trying to boost the ratings here so i'm not trying to you know throw shade i applaud the effort it's more effort than i would have done for writing a book about archaeology but yeah i just think it misses the mark in terms of um edutainment so it's not entirely useful for the classroom because this certainly was not the required the only required text it was one of several required texts. Um, I ended up having them do selective readings in addition to reading this novel, and the hope was the novel was the fun part. Turned out this was not the fun part compared to reading actual academic research. So that says volumes when a, a class of upper division um, undergraduate students would rather read a research article written in like the 80s or the 90s, uh, which is dry stuff, like it's a peer-reviewed scholarly research article, than read a 
edutainment novel. So I think that 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 is why I have to give this a two out of five. Um, I wouldn't give it a one because I don't think it's completely useless. However, I can't in good conscience recommend that people read this. It serves a role for someone who has a general passing interest, but I certainly would not view this as you know the edutainment that it's trying to be. Um, and as far as canning it or keeping it, this is uh, I'm actually going to can this. I don't have a reason to keep this on the bookshelf. I wouldn't use it for my class again, so it's not going to stay on the bookshelf. Um, giving it a two out of five, yeah, it's not staying. It does have writing in the margins, so I probably can't really try and resell it unless I tried to erase all of my pencil markings on it. So really, I'll probably add this to the the book bin that I'm forming of books that I want to can, so that eventually listeners can, um, you know, be entered in a raffle to win uh, stuff from my book bin, and then I'll mail it to you. But right now we've only got two. We've got this and Chinatown. So eventually we're going to get more books added to the book bin that you might be able to uh, get your hands on if you want a copy. Find out for yourself, um, Creekside. Is it for you? Maybe it is for you. I mean, certainly some people thought it was a four or a five out of five. But definitely my thoughts on it as an archaeology professor, two out of five. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. And on next week's episode, we're going to be doing a review of all the dictionaries in my library, which includes one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six. Eh, I guess I could throw in the foreign language dictionaries, too, just to cover all the dictionaries. So possibly seven to ten books that are dictionaries um, in English and in other languages. So that's going to be next week's episode is a dictionaries episode and, and talking about why you should probably have a dictionary on your shelf and what makes for a good dictionary or a good set of dictionaries. So until next time, never stop reading.